Jim Harbaugh is going to sit out three games, but is it really going to matter? And my picks for the college football playoff and the national champion. Let's go. It's the number one college football show. What's up, kids, folks? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcast. Today on the show, we're going to talk through some news. Michigan head coach Jim Harbaugh is going to miss the first three games of the season. The Ohio State quarterback derby persists. And we got to get to my college football playoff picks as well as a little bit about conference champions and who I think is going to win what conference inside of the Power Five, such as it is. But let's get started with the news that broke on Monday which is Michigan has self-imposed a three-game suspension for Jim Harbaugh following alleged recruiting violations. Harbaugh will miss the start of the season next weekend when the Wolverines play East Carolina as well as games against Las Vegas and Bowling Green. Big games there. Michigan also self-imposed a suspension to mitigate what might be some harsher penalties coming from the NCAA's Committee on Infractions. They also said in a statement, the university, that They will let you know who the interim head coach will be when it's time to have an interim head coach. Most people believe that's going to be Sharon Moore or Jesse Mentor. That'd be the offense coordinator, defense coordinator. But in these situations, it's not uncommon for a position coach to take over the head coaching duties because offense and defense are kind of, you know, lots of brain power activity. And not everybody can do both jobs, even when they do them well. See Jimbo Fisher. Now, Michigan received notice of its four level two violations and level one violation in January. The level one violation is considered the most serious by the NCAA. When they give you that, it's kind of the NCAA's form of an indictment saying, hey, this is coming. And then you basically start a negotiation period of this is what they think the penalty should be. This is what you think the penalty should be. So the violations include impermissible contact during the COVID-19 dead period on behalf of a couple of analysts and or Jim Harbaugh for an on the field instruction, things of that sort. But the NCAA also found that Harbaugh himself failed to cooperate with investigators related to the level two violation regarding his contact with two prospects during that COVID-19 dead period. And that means that he allegedly misled NCAA investigators. Now, the way that I look at all of this, I have to tell you that I'm from Oklahoma. Okay. In Oklahoma, we put it like this. It's a lot like getting caught fudging the numbers for the revenue man. Okay. Usually the revenue man finds out he's been cheated and he shows back up to you still with an ax, you know, looking to make firewood. So you can either pay him what he thinks you owe, or you can make like John Lee Pettimore and show him what Copperhead Road is really about. I'm kind of tickled by this. I, I really am, because this also went to the kind of the Twitters when we saw the committee on infraction raise its eyebrows at some of the things that were being said about it allegedly by Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. But I mean, goodness me, they're talking about a four game suspension, which we all thought back in July was going to be the thing. He was going to take the four game suspension. He was going to miss the first four games of the season for Michigan, which frankly, they do not need him to win. No disrespect, but you're East Carolina, Vegas and Bowling Green. Okay. Now, what's really interesting is how this is going to play out when they come back around to this getting to the committee in like January, February next year. And because we play will he or won't he with Jim Harbaugh and the NFL could see some more implications here, depending on just how hard the NCAA wants to come after Michigan, but it it won't matter. I mean, Michigan's one of the best teams in college football and they have one of the best rosters they've had in 25 years. I sincerely expect this to be a story for all of the first game when it's time to call a timeout and somebody gets the timeout right or gets the timeout wrong. But outside of that, Michigan ought to win these games by 40. So let's go from one Big Ten story to another Big Ten story. This one I find a little bit more intriguing. Ohio State's Kyle McCord and Devin Brown are still in competition for the starting quarterback job at the shoe. I thought that this job was McCord's to lose. He is the only guy on the roster who started a game last year. He's also the only guy on the roster who has been throwing passes to Marvin Harrison Jr. since high school. And I think he's athletic enough to do the job. There's been lots that's been made of what Devin Brown can do with his legs. Let me put it this way. Devin Brown ain't Justin Fields, but he ain't C.J. Stroud. 
But Kyle McCord ain't Justin Fields, and he ain't C.J. Stroud. Both of those dudes can move, and both of those dudes can sling it. And as it's been made clear to me, you need one of them to separate before you feel good about the job. And Ryan Day gave a very long quote that I want to read to you in its entirety because I believe it deserves its full context when we're talking about Devin Brown and Kyle McCord. He said, I asked the staff this weekend after the scrimmage, and I took a straw, a straw poll, and it was split almost down the middle, right? He goes on to say, look, we don't have to make a decision right now, so we're not gonna. But if the thing goes into the season, he's not going to stop it, which I think is kind of interesting and cool. One, they're that good because Ryan Day's hit record for quarterbacks is immaculate. I, I, I'm serious. It's, it's perfect. Dwayne Haskins, first-round draft pick. Justin Fields, first-round draft pick. C.J. Stroud, first-round draft pick. If you started games at Ohio State for Ryan Day, you're pretty damn good NFL draft prospect quarterback. So if he says it's got to go into the season, it's got to go into the season. But I'll put another one by you. You know who else had a quarterback derby go into the season and worked out just fine for them? Michigan. J.J. McCarthy, K. McNamara went into the season. J.J. wins the job. All they do is go 13-0 and into the college football playoff. I think it's fine, right? Now, they got some things to work out elsewhere, notably the defense, right? We know about that. But also at offensive line, particularly at the tackle positions, because Donovan Jackson is probably going to be one of the better offensive linemen in the Big Ten, even what Michigan has. But, you know, Donovan Jackson is a guard. We'll see how this goes. I'm fascinated to see how it does progress, because it's not as if we're going to learn a whole lot from Ohio State versus Indiana. At least I don't think we will. But if you see both of them, you shouldn't be surprised to see both of them at this point. And maybe we'll get to evaluate for ourselves which one of those guys we think can absolutely do the job, all right? The guy from Corner Canyon, the guy from St. Joe's Prep, either way, they're in a really good spot. Also, on top of that, Aaron Nolan showed out last Friday against Juju Lewis, and Juju Lewis committed to USC the day that we're taping this, uh, on Tuesday, right? The day that you're, after you're watching, excuse me, the day that you're watching this would be a day later. Yeah, so they also are pretty good at quarterbacks coming into the room is what I'm saying there. All right, let's go from those two news stories to some predictions. Everybody loves predictions. Everybody loves it when I rank stuff. This is a ranking show, and I, well, it matters. So we're going to start with Big Ten. I got Michigan winning the Big Ten. They're at number two in my rankings to start the preseason. As I said, this is Michigan's best team, well, since last year, honestly. In 1997, Michigan went 12-0 and and finished with a national title. In 2022, Michigan entered the Fiesta Bowl 13-0. and and finished number three ranked in the country. It's tough to win national championships now, man. The Wolverines have the best team they fielded 26 years, and a lot of that has to do with the backfield. J.J. McCarthy is good enough to compete toward Heisman finalist consideration. I think the votes would be split between he and another dude that's back there named Blake Corum, who stays levitating. That man had over 1,400 yards rushing, even though he only got two rushes against Ohio State, didn't play in the Big Ten Championship, didn't play in the Fiesta Bowl. Another way of saying it's not hard to see Blake Corm going for 1,700 yards last year and or make it tight for Caleb Williams, if nothing else, in the Heisman voting if he was healthy. That game also means the world. I, I swear to you, nobody was talking about Aiden Hutchinson as a Heisman finalist until he went ham, H period, A period, M period against Ohio State. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, that's one of the best players in college football because that game matters so much. Let's also add here, Jim Nagy was kind enough to come on this show and tell us there are seven NFL offensive linemen in that 24 class in the offensive line room at Ann Arbor, and he had never seen anything like that in one class before. And that's a man who has been scouting NFL players since the late 90s. He knows from football, executive director of the senior bowl, if you don't already know. Wolverines are also two-time defending Big Ten champs and you know have put boot to Buckeye behind twice in two years. I mean, that, that that in and of itself is worth hanging the banner for. And they did. It's called a Big Ten Championship. This could be the first instance that Michigan beats Ohio State three times in a row since 1995, 1996, 1997. Now they have to finish. Pressure is a privilege. Cook it or it will cook you. I also would add, we do you know these live tailgates around Ohio State, Michigan, and Michigan fans – I'm your lucky charm. As long as I've been hosting you know, at that tailgate, you ain't lost the game. Okay? Saying. Who, who, whose team we on? That, that's all I'm saying. Whose team we on? That's all. Okay? SEC. Let's go to my prediction for the SEC champion. 
Georgia, my number one team, duh. Everyone in Athens is sure about Carson Beck, new starting quarterback just named, and I get it. They're sure about a guy who spent two years learning from an offensive coordinator who is no longer there and threw 35 passes last year because the guy that was there led them to -to back-to-back national championships after they hadn't won a national championship in 40 years. No pressure, Carson Beck. But you know what? He's got dudes on that offense, none more important than tight end Brock Bowers, who just fixes everything. I, there was a, in, in the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, I watched this man catch a pass he had no business catching because Stetson Bennett put it where only Brock Bowers couldn't go get it, and then Brock Bowers was the only person that could come down with it. I mean, it was some Clifford Franklin stuff. Brock Bowers the only one going up. Brock Bowers the only one coming down with it. Man, I really do miss the replacements. Plus, it's hot enough that I could, I could just stay inside and get this AC in because it's 105 out here in Oklahoma, man. I I hear the ancestors calling right now. It's so hot. Let's move to the Big 12 where I got, shocker, Texas winning the Big 12 championship. They're ranked number 12 in my preseason poll, but, you know, depending on what they do against Alabama, they'll move up, right? You, you beat Alabama, especially Alabama's going to be undefeated going into that game. Yeah, it matters. And they had him on the ropes last year until Quinn Ewers got hurt, and that really was a turning point in the game. Even though the kicker makes the field goal at the end of the first half, Texas gets to beat Alabama before Tennessee does. And all Tennessee did last year was open the college football playoff rankings as the number one team in the country. Look, September 9th at Bryant-Denny against Nick Saban's Crimson Tide, that is the biggest game on the schedule for Texas this year, regardless of what they do in the Big 12. That win would go a long way toward winning 10 games for the first time since 2018 and perhaps the Longhorns' first Big 12 title since 2009. The pieces are there. Quinn Ewers, Xavier Worthy, Jalen Ford, Jalen Catalan, a head coach that knows how to win championships. But, you know, you've heard this before. You're not new. I understand. Preseason pills. They cure everything. We feel so good after taking preseason pills. They work every time, okay? Texas is for that for me right now, and right now I don't see who can actually stop them. I'm going to reference once again, my hometown team, Oklahoma Sooners, got the head kicked in 49-0 in the Cotton Bowl. Okay? Uh, there's no getting around that. Until they get that fixed, yeah, Texas is the best team in the Big 12 for me right now, even though Texas Tech beat both Oklahoma and Texas. wouldn't shock me if Texas Tech has a run in there too. I mean, it shouldn't shock anybody. Te- Texas Christian went 5-7, and seven, turned around, made the college football playoff finish national title runner-up. Wild this sport. All right, Pac-12, let's go there. I got USC winning the Pac-12 championship. They're my number four team in the preseason rankings. Caleb Williams be back there steaming, Willie Beeman on his, you can hate me now, four letters on his fingertips, lip syncing, ice cube, no Vaseline, repping for the University of South Central. All right, putting on for them bros down there. I'm with it, I'm with it. Coming straight out of Compton like NWA for the uninitiated. For the sake of this piece, NWA stands for nine wins assumed. I'm, I'm not gonna risk it. I'm not risking the game for that. No, no, no. You thought I was gonna go there. I got you though. Uh-uh, uh-uh. We're not going there. It's about getting past Notre Dame on October 14th for USC and beating Washington on November 4th. Those are seem to be the only two real roadblocks. I seem to be the only person that expects Colorado to put up a fight against USC at Folsom, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But it ain't about Caleb Williams being on his 100 miles and running. Man, I got the NWAs just coming out my ears right now. It's about the Grinch. Okay? Okay? Oklahoma fans know what I'm talking about. I need to see some Whoville hate coming out the 213. Empty in pockets like your name is you owe me. I need to see the defense's money. Okay? That ain't no hot take. Hell, Joel had that take on Monday. It's just the take, all right? I need the defense to put a lid on the end zone. Otherwise, I swear for the Lord, Caleb Williams might go for 500 yards, and the defense will give up 700 and lose by three. You can't get 47 put on your skull by Utah. Get 46 put on your skull by Tulane. I don't give a damn if Tulane had a best year. You're the University of Southern California. South Central, stand up. Snoop's University. Dre's University. Better put that black on and act like somebody. Then the ACC, you know, I'm the only person I think. I think there's few people. Maybe maybe a few people outside of uh, Clemson, South Carolina that is picking Clemson. 
to win the ACC title. Florida State seems to be the darling going into this preseason year. But that would mean the Tigers got to, I think, beat Florida State twice. First at Death Valley on September 23rd, and then once again the ACC title game. Behind Cade Klubnik, the play calling of Garrett Riley, and the sheer will of Dabo Sweeney, defense coordinator Wes Goodwin, he got, he got a squad. He got a squad. There are two, well, yeah, two All-Americans at linebacker on his defense, Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. I still – Marvin Harrison Jr., Jeremiah Trotter Jr. I'm 36 years old, and I feel old as hell because I was watching y'all daddies play, lighting people up, especially Jeremiah Trotter coming down that middle linebacker position, blowing people up. Jeremiah Trotter do Jr. doing the same thing. Clemson's going to be the best team in the ACC for me. It's about whether or not they can make the college football playoff as the best team in the ACC, and that ain't really a given. Like, quiet as it's kept, they've had to run the table to get everybody on board what they're doing, but I think they got it together with Garrett Riley as the offense coordinator. He's going to get Cade Klubnick some opportunities. He's going to shove the ball in Will Shipley's stomach, and he's going to ride that offense into, I think, about 40 a game, which leads me to the four teams that I am predicting to make the college football playoff, all right? Mm. No, number one, everybody consensus, the Georgia Bulldogs. Look, I'm going to get into Georgia in a little bit more, but suffice it to say, Kirby Smart has that thing running. It's a 442 Oldsmobile with a turbocharger. You know what I'm saying? Like it's got eight gears in that mug when it's only a five-speed transmission. I don't know. Something something down there that they do in Athens, just keep that thing going. For the last three years, they've lost one game in two years, guys. That's high school football stuff. For that matter, Michigan's lost three games in two years. I mean, it's it, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. On your worst days, you still get Ws. Next team I got on there, I think, is going to be Michigan because, well, they won the Big Ten Championship twice. Last year, they ran the table to do it. It seems like a foregone conclusion that whomever comes out of the Big Ten East is going to win the Big Ten Championship. I would love to see a Big Ten West team have something to say about that because. It's been Michigan stomping on Iowa, and it's been Michigan stomping on Purdue. But I can't recall the last time it wasn't absolutely a Big Ten East team stomping on a Big Ten West team. I'd like to see that change, but knowing that it is Michigan, Penn State, Ohio State, yeah, I got to go with Michigan right now. They're deep. They know who they are. They have an identity. And quiet as it's kept, they've actually got something to play for this year other than a national championship. Because now you got the NCAA saying, we want to suspend your coach. And you got a bunch of kids that committed to play for Jim Harbaugh going, oh, for real? Cool. Thanks for giving us something to play for. Thanks for us putting the NCAA infractions committee up on the bulletin board. Come on, as if they needed any more motivation. And then at number three on this list, but number four in my rank is at SC. This is me saying, Grinch, it's on you, baby. It's, it's on you. I know what the offense is going to be. I know what the offense is going to do. I know what Lincoln Riley is capable of. Three hyphen winners since the man started head coaching in 2017. Okay? He got dudes in the backfield. He got dudes at wide receiver. That offensive line is going to be just fine. I need you to show me you can stop people from putting up 40. And then we can talk about this. And then I got Alabama making it as the last team into the playoffs. And this is the part where it gets interesting to me. So those four teams, they look good on a graphic, right? When they put them out on the Twitters, on the Instagrams, on the Facebook, it's less likely to make people yell. But I can easily talk myself into Texas in this spot because all Texas got to do is beat Alabama and even take a loss, a single loss in the Big 12. I still think they'll get in because the college football playoff selection committee has decided the Big 12 is worth a damn. I know this because Texas Christian didn't win the Big 12 championship, and they still put them in. And then they were vindicated for doing it because Texas Christian – put up 51 on a 13-0 and Big Ten champ that gave Ohio State the what for without Blake Corum, all right? I can talk myself into LSU being there, but I just don't think that Brian Kelly's going to be the dude to be the first guy in the SEC West to knock off Nick Saban twice in a row since Hugh Freeze at Ole Miss in 2014-2015. How long ago was that? It's so long ago that Breland Speaks was on this show representing the Michigan Panthers reminiscing about being on those teams. I understand y'all y'all believe that Brian Kelly's about it down there in Baton Rouge. And you know what? He is. He absolutely is. But Nick Saban on something different. And I'm, I'm going with Alabama here 
also because Alabama's got the same deck that Michigan had last year. Both coordinators are brand spanking nil. No quarterback going into the season as of yet. We got a head coach. People are going, does he still got it? We got a head coach that was pissy and mad because he thought that he had one of the four best teams in college football last year and that he should have been into the playoff. I'm like, hey, dog, you can't you can't get beat down by Tennessee and LSU and expect us to like you ahead of a team that's got one fewer loss. But you know what? That's rationality and reason coming to a sport that abhors rationality and reason. And I can keep making arguments, I think, for lots of other teams. Ohio State, Michigan seems like a fluke last year. But if both of those teams are undefeated once again going into the game, and you've got one loss Pac-12 champ, one loss Big 12 champ, one loss ACC champ, it's real easy for us to see the two teams playing the SEC championship and Ohio State, Michigan getting back into the playoff. Like it's it's not hard. But right now, nobody's played any games. I'm gonna knock on some wood because injury ha- injuries ain't happened yet, right? And we have not seen some of the well, better moneyed programs putting money in the bag just yet. But, oh, you wait. It's coming. It, 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 it's coming. I got a whole list of FCS payouts right over here. Just wait for one of y'all to slip up. I hate that money in the bag game, but I love it because it's great content for us, right? So out of the four teams that I'm putting into the playoff, and after I talked all that smoke about LSU and Texas, who I got winning the national championship? The Georgia Bulldogs. Um, I'm saying, though, like, how do you not choose Georgia going into this season unless you want to get laughed at, yelled at, or probably both at this point? Because, once again, it's not just that Kirby Smart has this thing humming. It's that they got four preseason AP All-America first-teamers. They got Malachi Starks, a dude I tried to tell y'all about two years ago. I told y'all, I told y'all, I told y'all that man is a problem. And here he is, a bona fide problem quadratic equation in this mug all right they also got cedric van uh, C- yeah cedric van pran he's the center i think he's going to end up winning the remington award he put together a season for georgia they got javon bullard coming back they got brock bowers who once again is a problem it's the best tight end in our sport all carson beck got to do is be on his mike winchell in the 1988 permian panthers you exist between the snap and handing them backs the ball you run that end around, you hand that ball to Brock Bowers on some Debo Samuels. Don't fumble the ball. Don't get in the defense's way. And let's go do this a third time because that would mean the Bulldogs would become the first college football program to win three consecutive national championships since Minnesota managed that feat in 1934, 1935, 1936. Now, a couple things there. One, the Associated Press poll didn't even come out until 1936. Number two, you couldn't get any of the voters to agree on who a national champion was. I've seen some wild votes. Like, you go look through some of this stuff, and I have because I've I've literally put together an index of college football playoff associated press and coaches poll rankings going back for the last 10 years. And then I get funny, and I go look back at that stuff that happened before World War II, and I see things like this. However, think about how we're expecting Georgia to end up in the national championship game and, once again, end up winning a national championship, extending this ridiculous three-year run to something like 44-1, and one, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you about another team that had everything going for them, that looked like the most talented team on the face of the planet, and nothing could stop them but themselves. A little team called the United States Women's National Team. Yeah, I said it. Look, that team was also supposed to become the first ever to win three consecutive World Cups. We were all staying up late at night to watch those games at 2 a.m. local time, 5 a.m. local time. And then they got bounced in the knockout round by a country that is famous for its banking system. I'm saying, Georgia, if you do not come correct, South Carolina, Kentucky, Ole Miss, Tennessee, all coming for your neck. But it ain't got to be them. As I said, we talk about Sweden. Now, now, no disrespect to Sweden. Had a great World Cup. But that is not the team that we thought was going to do this. For that matter, I'm, I'm also happy to see Spain get their World Cup, mostly because it means that England didn't. 
in a year where it felt like everything was going their way and everything was going against us in Australia and New Zealand. And I'm kind of salty about it because that's my squad. That's my team. Ride or die. But I'm telling you, Georgia, don't go out like that. You got to do this for 15 straight weeks. Keep you focused. All right. That is going to do it for this episode of the number one college football show. On Friday, we'll come back with my favorite storylines going into the season. And we'll talk a little bit more about Coach Prime in prime time. My thanks as always to our lead producer, Tyler Wojak. Our senior producer is Catherine Donnelly. Our production assistant is Kiara Santana. Our social media maven is Javion Duncan. Our leads of screening are Torn Westfall and Jack Coakley. I'm the host, RJ. We'll see y'all later this week. Doses. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.